I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Foxholes, where I sit here in my chair of infinite knowledge and answer your questions about the Second World War. Okay, uh, Ryan Baxter writes to us, how did Polish troops get to France and Britain after the German invasion? Well, Ryan, that is a good question. Um, when Poland was invaded in 1939, most Polish soldiers had few choices apart from fighting and dying. They could also, they could surrender to the advancing Germans or Soviet forces, or they could flee to neighboring countries such as Hungary, Romania, and Lithuania. Many chose that option, option two, with the result that suddenly 70,000 Polish troops were soon in Romania and Hungary. Now, France had agreed to form Polish military units in France. But for the Polish soldiers, the question really was, how do you get to France? Romania and Hungary were sympathetic to Poland, but it was only a matter of time before German pressure would force them to hand over the exiled Polish soldiers. So they had to act fast. But you can imagine that a mass exodus might begin over Southern Europe, but the Hungarian and Romanian governments could not have this as that would provoke the Germans. So it was a secret exodus. This was done under the Hungarian and Romanian government's supervision, who secretly transported small groups of Polish soldiers from internment camps across the border. Groups of Polish civilians now began traveling through Yugoslavia to neutral Italy and then to France. These civilians traveled by any means necessary. Trains, horseback, on foot, you name it. But it was all done in secret. So there were no columns of tens of thousands of Polish soldiers marching through Europe. Only Polish civilians in small groups traveling quietly to France. Romania also allowed the ports of Constanta and Split to be used by Polish and Allied warships, who could then pick up as many Polish soldiers as possible and sail them to France. In total, Poland managed to quietly transport 43,000 troops to the newly formed Polish armed forces in the West under the command of General Władysław Sikorski. There, as we have seen, they would be ready to fight another day though exiled from their homeland. Okay, uh, Yaro Kotowski, or Kotowski, well, one of those, cool name though, anyway. Uh, Yaro asks, did any Americans serve in the armies of either side before joining the war? Yes. Though the Neutrality Acts of the 1930s had made it illegal for US citizens to volunteer to join the armed forces of foreign nations. See, if you were a volunteer, you could lose your American citizenship. And although that did stop many Americans from volunteering, there were still exceptions. Many young Americans became Canadian citizens and volunteered for the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, some 11, I think, Americans ended up flying for the RAF as Commonwealth British subjects. Other Americans simply just didn't care about the Neutrality Acts and volunteered anyway. And it should be said that American President Franklin Roosevelt later gave back all volunteers their citizenship, right? There are no accounts that I am aware of of American citizens joining the Wehrmacht or the other Axis forces. There were also the Eagle Squadrons, which I talked about in the regular weekly episodes. Uh, 6,700 Americans would end up volunteering for these squadrons. Only 244 ended up serving. By the end of the Battle of Britain and the Blitz, the Eagle Squadrons had shot down 74 German planes, suffered 77 Americans killed, along with 16 British pilots that flew alongside them. Let's see, who is next? Uh, Bruno Kaitar. I wonder where Bruno Kaitar is from. Well, Bruno, I don't know where you're from, but I'm answering your question, okay? Uh, Bruno Kaitar asks, uh, what happened to Kaiser Wilhelm when the Netherlands were occupied? Well, um, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, II abdicated as uh, Kaiser, German emperor, in 1918, just before the end of the First World War. Uh, the former Kaiser fled from headquarters at Spa in Belgium to the neutral Netherlands, settling first at Amarongen, where he issued his formal abdication announcement November 28, 1918. Um, after 18 months, he moved to the town of Dorn, where he spent the rest of his life. Wilhelm always harbored hopes of one day being Kaiser again and was resentful of how he was forced from the throne, reportedly, reportedly, telling an old German field marshal that the German revolution was a betrayal of the ruling house and the army by the German people who had been deceived and lied to by the Jewish rabble. Okay, well, rabid anti-Semitic fantasies 
dominated the former Kaiser's thoughts, and he was impressed by Hitler's rise to power. He was, however, disappointed that Hitler made little room for a restoration of the German monarchy, and he expressed horror at Nazi excesses, for example, during Kristallnacht. However, those reservations did not stop his enthusiasm for the foreign policy of the Third Reich, seeing it as a continuation of what he had tried to achieve while he held power. Indeed, he was so passionate on the matter that when Germany invaded the Netherlands and his cousin, Britain's King George VI, offered him asylum, he refused, not wishing to live in a country he saw to be poisoned by Jewish influence. Wilhelm was, um, I guess you could say, jubilant when the Wehrmacht entered Dorn, May 13th, 1940. Something undoubtedly helped along by the fact that his servants were freed. They had been interned by the Dutch upon the outbreak of hostilities. The former Kaiser even asked for champagne to be served at dinner that night and toasted the moment by drawing comparisons between historic Prussian victories. Adolf Hitler's feelings were not exactly mutual. Seeing the royal family as irrelevant to the new Germany and relaying orders to soldiers in the area to make no contact with the former Kaiser. Other top Nazis were equally dismissive. Goebbels referred to Wilhelm as an incorrigible fool who probably had Jewish ancestry. Wilhelm only had just over a year though to enjoy German-occupied Netherlands before dying in June 1941. And he spent most of that year in poor health and ignored by the Nazi. The Kaiser, former Kaiser, had already directed in 1933 that Dorn would be his provisional resting place as long as there was no monarchy in Germany. But seeing a propaganda opportunity to link Imperial Germany to the Third Reich, a delegation was sent from Berlin and the Fuhrer sent an elaborate bouquet of flowers and ordered Nazi regalia to be featured in the ceremony. The former Kaiser's body still lies in Dorn today, still waiting for a royal restoration in Germany. That is all for today. I'm sure you may have some questions you want to ask us, and please ask them at community.timeghost.tv, right? Because then we can have them all in one place. And if you would like to learn more about the American isolationism of the interwar years that those volunteers defied, you can click right here for a Between Two Wars episode about that. And support us at patreon.com or at timegoes.tv because your financial support is why we are able to make this show. See you next time. Mm -hmm.